What's up everybody? So it's the day. It's about eight o'clock in the morning. My plane leaves in three hours from Seattle. This is my wonderful mama. I love you, mama. I love you, son. I'm sadly saying goodbye to her, but we got a month together. That was fun. And I'm going on another adventure. Mm -hmm. The sea, here we come. I've been offered to board a plane bound for Hawaii. Get on a boat I've never seen with people I've never met and sail 3,300 nautical miles across the Pacific Ocean. What would you do? The boat in question is a 1984 Mason 63, designed by Alvin Mason in the late 1970s. Mason had, in his early career, worked for John Alden, whose famous designs include the Bristol 35, Fuji 45, and many custom schooners. Having also been the head draftsman for Sparkman Stevens, he took many of the design elements from the yachts he penned over his career and put them into his legacy boat, the Mason 63. The crew includes Mark, the owner of the boat, his daughter Erin, her boyfriend Jake, and my buddy Ryan. Yeah, okay, I know one of them. Needless to say, after 30,000 miles on a catamaran, I was more than a bit intrigued to see how this beautiful yacht would handle herself in the deep blue. This boat hadn't been out on the water since her crossing to Hawaii over a year ago, so we needed to go through and check to make sure she was seaworthy for the journey. The first thing we did was take the sails down to simultaneously check them for wear and check the halyards for chafe. For you non-sailors, halyards are the lines that hold up the sails. Okay, so we found our first problem here. This is the jib halyard. It goes onto the top swivel of the Harkin roller furler and pulls it up. So this is stay set and this is Dyneema chafe sleeve. And there's a pretty good, this is worn through all the way to the stay set. This will break underway if it, if it gets enough strain on it. So what we need to do is to take this and move it so it's on the block up a little further. So what we're gonna do is cut off this one. I'll, I'll cut off all the whipping and then um, probably just pull the whipping out and then we'll tie it in a bowline. That'll, that'll make that this block right about here instead. And then we're gonna lock wire all the shackles because one of the shackles was just completely, it was about to fall off. Uh, make sure all your shackles are lock wired because this one was like on the hairy edge of. The next step was to lube the sails as we raised them back up. That way, if we have any problems offshore, it'll be that much easier to get this big piece of Dacron down in an emergency. Checking the mizzen, that's the rear mast on a two-masted boat, we found a very similar problem where the chafe was even more significant. We handled this halyard in the same fashion and the mission sail was ready to go. I just got off the phone with Eric. We're getting our iridium. Uh, that's amazing. Thank you, Eric. You're the man. He, he went and dug through all my crap from Zingaro. Like seven boxes full of, sh full of sh to get that iridium. So now we're gonna make a list of what we need from the parts store. We need some 5200 and some butyl tape to uh, rebed anything that's leaking. Mark says that there's a couple of leaks, which means that there's probably going to be more than a couple, and one of them's going to piss water, because that's always what happens on a plastic boat. And then there's a couple lines we need replacing, and fishing line, because yeah. fishing is very important. Got to make the crew happy. Right, Ryan? Yes, sir. Going to catch some fish, what? some mahi mahi, what? and some tuna, what's maybe your, a sailfish. What's your favorite fish? Ooh, I got to say mahi, dorado. That is a good one. How about you, Mark? Tuna. Some blue fin, some yellow fin. All of Either one. Black fin. All of that. And I like Ono, so it doesn't matter what fish we get, it's gonna be our favorite one! After we dealt with all of the sails and gave the rigging a good inspection, it was time to visit the generator and the diesel. This boat has an absolutely breathtaking engine room with full access to everything, making oil changes and maintenance very easy. The deck is even designed to come off in the area above the engine so you can pick the engine out with a crane. This bad boy is a two-stroke Detroit Diesel 453, arguably one of the best diesel engines ever made. As it's just been rebuilt, it looks beautiful. Here you can see us cleaning out the seawater cooling strainer. That little basket will suck up anything from seagrass to jellyfish. Yep, you heard me. We found jellyfish in there. 
The last engine maintenance item was to change the fuel filters and change a cracked filter housing we found in our inspections. After seeing to the engine maintenance, we were ready to take the big girl out for a shakedown sale. We wanted to check that everything was, in fact, set up to do what it was supposed to do and test a few things we couldn't check at the dock. After raising the sails, the wind really piped up and we got a chance to do some training on reefing the sails. We also started the water maker to make sure it was making us the oh so important shower water. People get pretty stinky after three weeks on a boat. Okay, the day's over. We took the sails down and now we're beating into the wind. 23 knots, probably two meter waves, and it's not really fun. But the boat's handling it well. We're doing five knots, like straight up wind. I could never do this with Zingaro. So you said the propeller gives you the push, not the, not the engine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the propeller. A good propeller makes all the difference in the world. This is a max prop, four blade. Four blade? Four blade. Wow. Lots of traction. Maybe I'll go down below and show you guys what's banging around down there. <laughs> well, this is why you do a sea trial. We found many broken latches, leaking deck hardware, and other points of maintenance we needed to deal with. And after we got into port, Mark and I had a meeting to make a list of everything we needed to do before departure. We tested the EPIRB, sealed the mast once again, replaced the weather stripping on the aft lazarette hatch. For you non-sailors, lazarette is a fancy word for locker. And rebedded a few of the deck protrusions. Now we were finally ready to go. Go, 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 go! Okay, hit it! It's yeah. worked! We did it. We're just getting some fuel here before we leave. We should be leaving around uh, 5, 6 o'clock, so we're getting everything prepared, ready to go. It's said that the hardest knot to untie is the cleat hitch. That's the knot tying the boat to the dock. It's a very exciting and scary time to finally leave the dock. And after stopping to fuel up, we were treated by an absolutely amazing sunset our first night out to sea. During the night, we noticed that the breaker for the navigation lights kept tripping. And for the life of me, I couldn't figure out why. So the decision was made to stop at Hanalei Bay on Hawaii's Kauai Island to troubleshoot. So the reason that the breaker kept tripping for the navigation lights is the stern light has a wire that goes through the stern pulpit. And the stern pulpit is connected to the lifelines. And that whole thing is charged because somewhere in there that wire is frayed and it's touching the stern pulpit, which is in then grounding to the lifelines. So as long as they're floating, they're fine. But as soon as we put these whisker poles on, they started touching the standing rigging and they were sparking. And the only reason I saw, I saw it was because it was really dark last night and I thought there was a light going on up here. It was like light, 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 light. And I was like, what is that? And I saw the sparks and I was like, oh shit, we're gonna catch the boat on fire. So I moved the whisker poles up and that solved the problem of it overloading. The problem is this whole thing, all of these wires and these stanchions and the whisker poles are now charged. Well, it's not gonna start a fire unless there's some kind of like grease or oil or diesel on on your clothes but uh it's it's, st it's still a problem so we've got the rest of the pacific to figure this one out these are my friends jen and john from caro babo this is the second time we've met and we've yeah. been friends for a few years mm. uh john has a blog and uh you are an ex-journalist printer That's what we say, newspaper industry. He's got a strong command of the English language. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, buddy. Good to see Good. you. Thanks for rowing over. Yeah, we see you in different places. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Yeah. What are you monkeys doing? So oh, using my monkey toes to pull things out of the chain locker.
After fixing the navigation lights and playing in the water for the day, we were ready to raise the anchor and head out on what would become a 3,300 nautical mile journey all the way from 21 degrees latitude in Kauai to 48 degrees north, that's Vancouver Island, and back down to our final destination, San Francisco, at 37 degrees. We didn't know what we had in store, but we were all saying a small prayer to Neptune to get us through safely. It is officially day three. Uh, we left Kauai yesterday. It's about six in the morning. I'm just getting off watch. Ryan's up here to relieve me. We've been doing eight knots all night, traversing between like three, three, five, and three, four, five, which is actually better than I thought we would do. I thought we'd be at like th three, two, zero or something. But we've made it 110 miles and we left at uh, like four. So in 17 hours, we've done 110 miles. So we're not, we're not breaking any records, but we're averaging probably seven, 7.4 knots, something like that. So, oh no, wait, it's, it's only been 14 hours. So that's even better, 7.5, 7.6. The wind has been pretty constant at 18 knots and Every once in a while, a wave will just hit the boat and it'll come through here and it'll just splash this entire area. Like, this is all wet here on the table. I had to get my Fowleys on last night because I was freezing cold. Uh, but now it's gonna warm up, so Ryan should be fine. It might bring a sweater up here on Night Watch from now on though. Yeah, about that time. Yeah. We is gonna go do some fishing. Al Sprague made for us. Yes, the thing is rigged up ourselves a little wire leader with a uh, swivel and some 250 pound test trawling line. Cool. This thing is the craziest thing to me. <laughs> like, look how far it's going. It's like it's like 90 degrees to the rest of the boat. <laughs> I don't know if I'll ever get used to that. All right guys, so one of the things about being on a boat is always having your awareness of where your lines are run and what's gonna bind up with other things. So I was looking at this line right here. This is called a preventer. And what a preventer does is it prevents your boom from swinging the other way and slamming in case you had a wind switch or somebody wasn't paying attention at the helm. So what we're going to do is we're going to move this preventer on the inside of our safety lines. So in case the wind twitches or we have some kind of a problem, um, it's not going to rip our barbecue off and pull on these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a little line that's going to go around here to attach our preventer. So it goes from here to here instead of from outside of here to out here. So, we're gonna take this little piece. We're gonna do a regular little knot, okay? I'm gonna put this through here. We're gonna make another little overhand knot. And what that is, we got these two knots, we pull them together. Those are lover's knots. Fisherman's knot. Or a fisherman's knot. Now we got ourselves a loop. Now what we can do. Ooh. Fall off the boat. Try not to do that. <laughs> what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop this. Around here. And we're gonna do another pass. Through like that. And you're going through itself, right? Just through itself, yeah. And that should be enough. Put tension on it. That sucker is not going to slide anywhere. So now that we've got this guy fixed, where we want it. 
We're gonna take this preventer off and we're gonna move it in front. swings this way, this is going to prevent this boom from swinging that way and ripping everything else off. Yeah, that'll be a lot easier to tack now too because we can just disconnect it from here and then bring it over here and connect it to the other one. Before we had to whip it around the entire back stay and like lean out over the boat. So nice job, Rye. Good, yeah. good on you, brother. It's got, this stuff is called Spartite. It seals the mast in this little boot. And I think what's happening is every time it's loaded down, it's separating the mass from the Spartite. And it's just leaking a little bit because we sealed it here on the back, but we haven't sealed it all the way around the mass. So I'm gonna put a little bead all the way around the mass and I hope that'll fix it. I think it will. So a little trick with this 5200 stuff, keep it in the freezer. It'll make it a little harder when you're in really hot climates. Otherwise it gets really runny. Another little trick that you've seen me do if you've been paying attention is to lick your finger before you touch the adhesive. That way you can make it nice and pretty without getting any on your hands. Because as all of us sailors know, that 5200 is some nasty stuff. It's such good adhesive that we often call it, screw the next guy. So this is a series of knots, I guess, that um, after said and done, we call it the butterfly testicle hitch and it's for fastening something, cinching something down towards a cleat. So you start off by making a loop. Some people might call this a perfection loop. You run a, just kind of like a pretzel there, back through your main loop, and then around your main line, tag end around the back side of the main line, through your main loop, and then around, the two strands where your bite or, or final loop is going to be. Just get that tag end to stick out and cinch it down nice. So Ryan, if you can just hold your finger there, like your finger is the cleat, right? Yeah. Then you're going to take your main line and run like you're a bite through it, like you're making a trucker's hitch. There's your butterfly testicles, okay? So then I'm gonna be the object we're cinching down to the cleat. And you're just gonna, you can run like a clove hitch off of this or just loop around, whatever you need to do to fasten your um, object down. We'll do a clove hitch around my arm. It's so the object. And then you finish it like a trucker's hitch. Oh, damn it. Just like that. Yeah. Cinch it down. Ryan is the cleat, remember? And just tie a bite to finish your trucker's hitch. Oh. Cool. And bam. A complicated series of knots that we call the butterfly testicle hitch. <laughs> Mostly for boat applications, so what, things like that. Can you tie this again, this part of it? What, what oh yeah, that's just a, like a main line oh, bite. Just, overhand. just a main line bite. Uh, um, quick release system. Got it. If you tie it from this end, it doesn't work, right? A lot of people know that. You have to just play with it so you know which side you're tightening. Oh, I see. Otherwise, if you, if you cinch this down, and you pull on it, it just cinches down to your other line. Say my finger's the line. Yeah. So if I tie this the wrong on the wrong side of the line, you just make a slip loop. It's gonna cinch down to my line and it's gonna be a pain to get out later. So you always have to tie that down. See how it cinches? Yeah. You always have to tie the start of that like trucker's hitch 
on the right side of the line, otherwise it's going to cinch down. So you want your main line to be able to pull that trucker's pitch loop like free. So I'm pulling the main line. It's all a matter of where your tension is coming from. I like that knot. Pull the hitch around your arm or whatever you're cinching down to the cleat. Back through. I can kind of cinch that and tie a regular bite so it's all easy to undo later. Love it. Cool. Alright, so what do we do? Lose the fireman's carry. Fireman's carry, yeah. If you were to do that and just loop them across, you get yourself a clove hitch, right? But instead of overlapping them, like this, like this, see how this will lock together? This way doesn't work. You gotta go this one under and that one over and through the loops. That so cinch down. Once you got that, make a half hitch and throw this loop through that half hitch. And then this one, make another half hitch and throw that loop through that half hitch. Like that. And now you can pull on those. And those loops don't tighten up. They stay the same size. And like this would like my upper body, you could, my and shoulders. This would rest under my armpits. Yeah. And, and then, then that my would be like butt a seat. would sit right there. Yeah. And then Ryan could pull me up the side of a building or the side of a boat, just like that, or lower me back down using that With main those. line. Yep. Up or down. Yep. Pretty cool, eh? Pretty cool, mate. You know what I mean, bro? Can you guys see the rainbow? That's a pretty one. So I just reefed down the whole boat. Uh, mizzen's on the single reef, main's on a single reef, staysail's put away, and the jib is fully out. We are doing 9.2 knots on a course of 340, and the sun's about to set. It's, it was a beautiful day today. This is like what sailing days should be. Sunny, good wind, 15 knots of wind all day. Just picked up now that the sun's going down, so hopefully that'll actually stay, because we want to be trucking. Uh, wind forecast comes out in an hour, and we might see the green flash tonight. Have you ever seen the green flash, Aaron? Yeah. Yeah? Yep. How about you, Mark? Yep. She's pretty wet. We've been taking waves all day. We're kind of beating up wind. Uh, we're keeping the wind at about 60 degrees so we can make some northerly progress because there's a big high coming through on the north and then there's the low uh, up there by Canada. So we've got to go all the way around that and kind of shoot the gap and split that and come back down. I'll show you guys on predict wind. All right, guys, let me tell you a little bit about this Mason and what I think of the boat. We are doing 10 knots right now, 10 knots, with a reef in the main and a reef in the mizzen and the, full, the jib fully out. Uh, this is the nicest 10 knots I've ever done on any boat. Um, be that as it may, this is the biggest sailboat I've ever taken a passage on, so I don't have a lot to compare with. But if I had to choose between this and Zingaro doing 10 knots, I would choose this any day. Whoever gets this boat is lucky. She's a stout, good sailing, uh, very, very nice sailboat. And I'm not just saying that because Mark said he'd give me 5% on the sail. Because <laughs> he didn't say that. <laughs> uh, seriously, yeah, I'd love this boat. If I had an extra 150 grand, I would buy this right now. I don't know if I'd want the maintenance on a 65 footer, but this is a nice boat. I can't believe we're doing 10 knots. We're doing 10 knots, reef down.
It's insane. Who built this? <laughs> they did a good job. What's your thoughts, man? Is this uh, a common thing for you to be doing over nine knots average? Yeah. We, we, we had many days where we were doing over nine knots on our first Pacific crossing. Yeah? Yeah. And you hit 10 knots on that crossing too? Several times. Yeah. Not a problem. Going upwind? Because we're pretty much going upwind right now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And the motion, I mean, I just fell off five degrees. I went from 340 to 335, and we are just kind of cruising, doing between nine and 10 knots. And that's impressive. This well, is. That's one thing about 70,000 pounds. It goes through the water, it doesn't go over the water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the sails are trimmed just about, about as good as they can be, and we're ready. I just put all the reefs in myself. I feel pretty proud about that. This boat can be single-handed. Uh, it would be a pain in the ass because it took me about 15 minutes of working to get all the sails down just to the first reef, to get the staysail in, get the main down to the first reef, and get the mizzen to the first reef. It took about 15 minutes. Uh, it would be a little dangerous to single-hand this thing, but it can be done. How about you, Mark? What do you think? Single handing? Yeah. Too much work for an old man. <laughs> so. What's you making, buddy? We are making pizza tonight. And I think the last one is ready to come out of the oven. Oh, yeah. Look at that beauty. Wow. What is it? That one's got uh, barbecue chicken and uh, pepperoni, some cheese, uh, pre-made crust, standard uh, sauce on there. Oh, it's good. All right, it's morning day four. Um, it's about five o'clock in the morning. The sun's just coming out. Um, we've been doing. 353 all night, which is north northwest, and uh, there was a system that just came through right when I was coming on watch, and now we're going a little bit farther north. The wind is coming from over here. Uh, before it was coming from kind of right right forward of the beam. Now it's our aft starboard quadrant, which is the right backhand side. I'm just waiting to turn the boat back around a little bit and watch the sunrise. So you can hear the sails kind of luffing because we would just pass the system and it actually just ran over top of us, got us a little wet. Uh, that's been happening all night. It's been a couple beautiful days of sailing and now we're starting to get into the storms uh, just because I think this is where the temperature is gonna start cooling down a little bit. I'm in my Fowleys and uh, I think that we'll be in those for a little while. We're still heading north, right towards Alaska, right where we wanna go and um, a new forecast comes out in half an hour. So I'm gonna download that and we'll see what we can see. So right after sunrise, the wind let up and I needed to shake the reefs out of the sails. So that's what you can see me doing here. I'm taking the halyard down, unhooking the sail from the reef hook and raising it up the rest of the way. After that, the wind was at a good bearing to put all the sails up. So I loosened the staysail sail and then there was four. But no rest for the weary. The refrigerator was causing us problems. So we figured out that the uh, strainer is not clogged. Something's wrong with the compressor. Maybe it's not getting power. Maybe it's, we're trying to figure it out. We're gonna prime it and try it again. So this would be a problem that would haunt us for the entire way. What we ended up figuring out here was that the boat was going fast enough where the water moving past the through hole was causing a vacuum and actually sucking air through the line and unpriming the pump. So we needed to prime the pump every time we went over nine knots, which was really a pain in the butt. The way to remedy this would be put a check valve on the exhaust water for the refrigerator or close the inlet when you were done running the refrigerator. The problem with that is the inlet was underneath the engine. And we would have had to crawl in the engine room every time. So this will be an ongoing problem, you'll see.
Okay, false alarm on the, what is it called? What was I working on? Oh, the refrigerator. False alarm on the refrigerator. It looks like we just preemptively started working on it without checking to make sure it was not below the temperature it needed to be to click on. So <laughs> I, th I think it's actually at 13 and a half now. It was at 12 before, so it should turn on now. You wanna try it? Okay. Let's see. Let's hear. It will be right under here. Yeah. That's it. It's not staying on. It's not staying on? It's the, the prime. Oh, it's the prime? Oh, they picked it up. There it goes. Yeah. Look, I fixed it. Mark fixed it. Okay, I just took the first shower I've taken all trip. Look at my hair, it's so silky smooth. <laughs> and uh, I feel great, that's, that's a great shower. All right. Okay, this is our first uh, catastrophe. We're three days in and this is really messed up. So uh, we were going to take a second reef on the, on the main and the second reef line got wrapped around the boom, got stuck. We had to undo the, the jack stays. That got let go of and got, went all the way up the mast so we just took all the sails down. The wind is about 21 knots. And it's, you know, it's not like life or death, but it's, it's kind of scary, you know? I'll show you guys this mess. at home. Okay. Oh my god, I don't want to do that again this trip. Let's not do that again. Yeah. Now on, if, the, if they get these get hung up, they just need to we just need to go up wind. We need to turn the
Okay, crisis averted. We have uh, all the sails back up. I went up the mast, got the thing down, we fixed the jack stays. But in the confusion, someone was in the shower. And she has a scopalamine patch on. A scopalamine patch is a little patch you put behind your ear to help with seasickness. And uh, what does it say on the box? Um, not to, if you, if you touch it, you gotta wash your hands. And if you get it in your eye, you have to seek medical attention. So, did you get it in your eye? I sure did. Have you, have you seeked medical attention? No. Nope. Show everybody. Oh my god, <laughs> your left pupil is so much bigger than the other one. <laughs> you need to seek medical attention. Yeah. I mean, do you want to like call someone? I think the... I'm the closest thing to a medic we have on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Do you want to like call, use the sat phone and call? No, it'll someone? go away. I mean, my mom. Are you sure? My you mom did like this and it went away. You have a brain injury. Oh, <laughs> poor <laughs> girl. <laughs> <It's so big. laughs> well, at least you're clean. Yeah, I'm clean. Okay, status update. It's still day four. Uh, everybody took a nap right after lunchtime after we had some sandwiches. We had some um, trouble this morning where we were trying to get the main double reef down and I let go of the jack lines and it just went all the way up to the second spreader. Then I had to go in the bosun's chair. We had to go up wind and it was just the worst time. It was like 24 knots of wind. Oh, yeah. And so after that, everybody took a nap. Mark was up here and he noticed that we had a fish on the line. So he woke everybody up and said, hey, are you guys ever gonna come up here and get this fish? And we caught a sailfish. And uh, none of us knows really if sailfish is gonna be good. I've had it before smoked, and I've heard that it's bad uh, as sushi. We tried it all raw, and it was a little gamey and fishy, so we're gonna try it. Marinated as steaks and grill them, and then we filleted some, make it into like, I don't know, pasta sauce or something. Or maybe just like bread it and fry it, and uh, have some fried sailfish. Pretty fish. Uh, them two are cleaning up all the sailfish. This guy in the cockpit doing more lures because he's a fish maniac. And overall, it's been a great day. Great day. I'm tired today, though. Going up the mast was scary. Okay, it's sunset. We've got rice cooking downstairs, and we've got the sailfish grilling in the back after marinating for about an hour and a half. Come on, let's go see. Oh my god. That looks good. A little shake, extra shake there. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Now we're living. Happy buddy? That's some good eating right there. <laughs> See how my secret sauce comes out. Yeah, I think there was a lot of Yeah, so I don't fall backwards. <laughs> or into the barbecue. That's teamwork right there. Oh, <laughs> well, that fucker's hot. I That's don't want so to, cute. I don't want to be wearing this thing, man. Okay. You can let go now, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> but I just don't want to. Uh -huh.